with me to the book of the Revelation at chapter number 3, verses 1 through verse number 6. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Verse 6 reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk this morning about an autopsy of a dead church. An autopsy of a dead church. The church at Ephesus was the fallen church with the perennial problem of fundamentalism. The church at Smyrna was the fearful church with the perennial problem of ritualism. Pergamos was the faltering church with the perennial problem of clericalism. Thyatira was the false church with the perennial problem of sacerdotalism. Sardis is the fruitless church with the perennial problem of liberalism. Suppose you were crawling, scorched near death across a hot, burning desert. Your throat was almost closed from thirst. Your body was just about paralyzed from the sun. And you look up and see a sign in the distance that says, cool, clear, life-giving water five miles ahead. And you crawl almost dead to Tearwester Street and see this magnificent sanctuary. Open the door because the sign advertises cool, clear, life-giving water. And with your last ounce of strength, you drop your bucket in the well only to hear the thud of that bucket hitting the bottom with no water. You pull up the bucket and there's only dust and that dust cannot quench your dying thirst. That's what happens at a lot of churches, that we advertise cool, clear, life-giving water only for people to drive up here to a mirage. It's, it's false advertising. You claim to be one thing, and in reality, you're something altogether different. Such was the condition of the church that we are considering today. 
that no mention of persecution against Christians is mentioned in Sardis is significant. They were at home with the Gentile culture. They had taken on the character of the city in which they resided. Satan did not have to pressure them with persecution or temptation because they were already dead. They had become comfortable with the world and had no price to pay for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sardis, brothers and sisters, was the capital city of Lydia, founded about 1200 B.C. The city was the home of Aesop, from which you will remember from childhood stories, Aesop's fables. Aesop was born in Sardis. Gold and silver coins were minted in Sardis. As a matter of fact, Sardis is the birthplace of the minting of coins. It was also known for a rich red dye and its te textile industry. They dyed wool and they dyed carpet and they dyed garments. The, the, the dyeing of, of textiles was invented in Sardis. Sardis was also the richest of the seven churches of Asia Minor. They were ruled by a king named Croesus, from which we get the phrase even now, rich as Croesus. But the church had become a thermometer rather than a thermostat. Uh, the church at Sardis registered the temperature rather than change the temperature. A thermometer registers tem a temperature, while a thermostat changes the temperature. This church had become lazy, apathetic, and complacent. Take notice of the stark contrast of this church and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a stark imagery and a deliberate contrast. The church Jesus said, you have a name that you're living, but you're really dead. Jesus was dead, but he's alive again. This church was alive, but is now dead. This church is the reverse of the one who called him. Jesus said, I was dead, but I'm alive again. This church was alive, but now it's dead. And this, this Jesus, this Christ of ours, comes as the great physician to perform an autopsy on this dead church. And the great physicians make, the, he, he first of all makes a prophetic pronouncement. He proclaims his deity to this church. Look at verse number, number one. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, these things said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He's proclaiming his deity. The seven spirits of God are the, 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 the complete work of the Holy Spirit. Seven is a number of completion. And the seven spirits of God is talking about the character that the church ought to have. And the seven spirits are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 2, the spirit of the Lord rests upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. All of that ought to be present if you are really the church of God. And then he talks about the seven stars or the seven pastors, the seven angels of these churches. It has to do with holy character and holy calling. Because if a church does not have a holy character, it cannot live up to a holy calling. Somebody ought to help me preach here this morning. He proclaims his deity and then he proclaims his discernment. He says, I know 
your works. Uh, I know your works. Uh, this, this pronouncement is no word of commendation. He does not commend them for any good thing that they are doing. He says, I know your works. And here is what he knows about them. He knows that they claim to be something by reputation that they are not by character. I wish I had two or three more witnesses here. They claim to be one thing by reputation. And as a matter of fact, all they have left is reputation. And church... We can't live on yesterday's reputation. God has called us to more than what we used to be. And if all the church has left is reputation, you're dead. Dead rituals. Dead singing. Dead preaching. Dead tradition. I have no trouble with tradition uh, because tradition is what we do every Sunday morning. Come to this church traditionally. But I don't want us to, to slip into traditionalism uh, because tradition is the living faith of the dead. But traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Somebody ought to help me preach it. And, and if we have become so steep in the past, we are dead. He proclaims his diagnosis. Our brothers and sisters, the polar star, the polar star, it takes 33 years for the light of the polar star to reach earth. That star could have been dead 20 years. And it still takes 13 years for the light to reach earth. It's a dead star, but it's still shining. Somebody ought to help me talk. It, it takes 33 years for the light of the polar star to reach earth. And the star could have been dead 20 years, and it's still shining 13 years later. I, I hope I could get that over to you this morning. These flowers this morning are beautiful and colorful to look at, but they're dead. They are lifeless. And that can happen to a church. Beautiful colors on Women's Day. Nice carpet, spectacular gleaming glass, beautiful parking lots, nice building, great budget, lovely people. Look alive. You got a name that you're alive. You got a reputation that you're alive, but you're really dead. Kind of like some of us look on Sunday morning. No joy. Stone face. Choir sings, you don't move. The deacons pray, you're not impressed. I preach, you fall asleep. You have a reputation that you're living, but you're really dead. Lily Grove, that can happen to us. But he moves from a pronouncement to a prescription. His, his prescription is in the text. He wants them to, first of all, remember. There must be a remembrance of the past. Listen, brothers and sisters, it is only when the first moving of God is forgotten that a church settles down and becomes institutionalized. It is only when the first moving of God is forgotten that a church settles down and becomes institutionalized. We must never allow a movement to become a monument. 
Uh, let me let me let me let me spend a minute right there. Uh, this church, Lily Grove Church, Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, began with a man's vision. Some people caught the vision over on Drew Street, and it became a movement. The church moved from Drew Street as a movement to Lily Grove with some momentum. And now, with this new sanctuary coming up in the back and all these parking lots and these buildings connected, we've moved from a vision and a movement and momentum to now we are a machine. But if the Spirit of God leaves us, we move from a vision to a movement to momentum to machine to a monument. And all it takes is one generation and a vision can become a monument. Uh, brothers and sisters, that's why, that, that, that's why I get in trouble with my Black Lives Matters friends. Uh, I, I get into fierce arguments with my Black Lives Matter friends. Because if Black Lives Matter, you can't be disingenuous with your argument. Your argument has got to be logical on both sides. If black lives matter, it don't just matter when you tear up a Donald Trump event. It does not matter when you tear up a Bernie Sanders event. Black lives got to matter on the streets of Houston when there's a killing on Scott Street. Why are we not protesting on Scott Street and in South Lawn and I wish I had a witness here. If black lives matter, why are we not protesting these poorly constructed schools where our children have to go into run-down schools in run-down neighborhoods with library books that still have Richard Nixon as the president? If black lives matter, why aren't we teaching these young boys, pull your pants up, stop going to jail, Go to school, get you a job, and raise your children. Listen, listen, listen. You, 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 you saw this melee, this, this disgraceful melee that took place at Donald Trump's rally uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I need to say this on television that we ain't got no dog in this fight politically. Because nobody is trumpeting our cause. Now, now this is some in-house talk. You know, when you were growing up and your mom and daddy would talk some stuff in the house, they said, don't you take my business outside this house. This, this is some in-house talk I'm talking right now. President Obama is a beneficiary of the civil rights movement, but he hasn't done much for black cause. Uh, th this is some in-house conversation here. Uh, he, he has trumpeted the homosexual agenda and not historically black colleges and universities, nor our black communities. If the Lord don't help us, Donald Trump can't help us. Bernie Sanders can't help us. Uh, Marco Rubio can't help us. Ted Cruz sure ain't gonna help us. Hillary Clinton can't help us. If the Lord don't help us. I wish I had somebody to help me here. Here's what I mean. By one, we are one generation away from Lily Grove becoming a monument. Back to the civil rights movement. It was a vision that caught fire. And it became a movement. And then it moved from a movement in Birmingham to a, 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 a momentum that picked up in 1963 with the, with the I Have a Dream speech. And then it, it became a machine it was a civil rights machine, and we had a cause to fight for. 
But now you visit those churches that only was involved in the movement. And they are now a tourist attraction. 16th Street Church in Birmingham is a tourist attraction. Ebenezer in Atlanta is a tourist attraction. And when you come back to the church, nobody in the 18th century preached to more people than Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But Metropolitan Church in London now is a tourist attraction. Wish I had somebody to help me preach. And all it takes is a generation to stop caring about the past or worshiping the past for your church to become a monument. Those of us who read the Bible will remember God won great victories through Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. And God won great victories through Gideon. And after Gideon had won the victory, I need two or three Bible readers here. The Bible says he took the ephod and turned it into gold. And that golden ephod, the people began to worship it. I wish I had a Bible read. And Gideon would not stop them from worshiping that golden ephod. And in the worship of that ephod, they forgot who brought them. And the moment you start to forget who brought you, it will not be long before you are spiritually dead. I need somebody here to help me remember. I said, I need somebody to help me remember that it was nobody but Jesus. Remember the past. But furthermore, there must be a recognition of the present. He says, hold fast to those things that remain and repent. Now that word repentance has fallen on some hard times. But brothers and sisters, repentance means more than changing your mind. It means changing your direction. Because you can change your mind and never change your direction. I wish I had a witness here. Uh, It's kind of like dieting. Uh, You know what you ought to eat. You know what you ought to do. But you just look at your exercise equipment. Talk back to me if you can. You, you just look at fruits and vegetables and go on to the pork bones and steaks. You, you know what's right, but you don't do what's right. So you have not really repented. Because repentance is not just changing your mind, it's changing your direction. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. And then, brothers and sisters, there was also the readiness for the future. He says, if you don't repent, I will pull the plug, pronounce you dead, and put a sign over your door, mark out Lily Grove, and put a sign over your door that reads Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory of the Lord is gone. And we'll show up every Sunday. Ichabod. The ushers become Paul Barrows. The deacons become embalmers. Preachers become funeral directors. Preachers go to school instead of seminary. It's cemetery. Ichabod. The glory of the Lord is gone. And we hang a steeple over a moor. That's what I almost called this sermon this morning. A moor with a steeple on it. People walking in there look alive, but they're dead. 
because their works are not perfect before God. Listen, brothers and sisters, I know it doesn't feel good to hear, but God is not interested in a Christianized version of your old life. He's not interested in a Christianized old gambler. A Christianized drug addict. A Christianized dope dealer. No, no, you can't add Jesus to your life and keep your other stuff. Because when Jesus is in your life, the other stuff got to go away. I wish I had my 7.30 cry. You can't have Jesus and your rabbit's foot. Jesus and your four-leaf clover. Jesus and your lucky bracelet. Because Jesus is not an addition to life. He is life. Jesus is not one of the ways. He is the only way. Jesus is not a part of the truth. He is the truth. Jesus is not something you add to life. Jesus is life itself. And God is not interested in a Christianized sinner. Uh, hear me, brothers and sisters. We... We are so busy trying to be relevant and trying to attract people that we forget what our mission is. Our mission is to make disciples. Our mission is to call people out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And sometimes you got to hurt people's feelings. Sometimes you got to make people angry. Because if you are the church of God, you're not going to please everybody. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Because the servant is no greater than his master. Have I got a witness here? You got to be different from the culture that's around you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Have I got a witness here? Be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I would rather us not build a church if we ain't going to build some people. Because what difference does it make to build a church and put Christianized sinners in there. See how quiet you got right there? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It, it may be prophetic. It, it, again, I'm not a prophet. I'm not even a son of a prophet. But, but I'm asking the Lord to stop our progress if we're not going to build people. Uh, don't, don't have us go in this building with Christianized sinners. Don't have us go in this building with flowers that look alive, but they're artificial and dead. I wish I had two or three more with us. Because it doesn't make sense for brick and mortar and stained glass and, and, and money and all of that stuff, and you're not a believer. Get your mind off the stained glass. Get your mind off the building. Get your mind off the process and make disciples. Go in the hedges and the highways and compel men to come to Jesus Christ. It's not about a building. If my people, I wish I had a Bible reader, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. You got a name that you're living. 
but you're really dead. That's the great physician's pronouncement. That's the great physician's prescription. And all of which has been bad news. But preaching when it's real never leaves you with bad news. I've got some good news. And it's right here in the text. He says, there are some of you. There's a remnant of you who have not yet soiled your garments. Somebody ought to help me preach it. There's, there's always going to be a remnant. Thank God that there's a remnant present who have not sold out to the world. I say, thank God there's a remnant who has not yet defiled themselves. It, it, it's, it's a few of us left who's still holding up the bloodstained banner. It's a few of us left who are not compromising the gospel. It's a few of us left who still believe there's a bright side somewhere. There's a few of us left who's not going to let the world squeeze us into its mold. They're going to talk about you. They're going to lie on you. They're going to persecute you. But Jesus said, just keep holding on. And when I come, you will walk with me in white. For you are worthy. Now, brothers and sisters, here's the whole message, and I'm through. If you stand the test, if you don't compromise, if you don't bow down, imagine this scene, and if this don't make you shout, I doubt your salvation. One day, Jesus himself will take you by the hand and march you through the gates of pearl up the streets of glory past the cherubim past the seraphim past the tree of life past the river of life and bring you up to the throne of God and take your hand in his and say this is one of mine This one has not defiled himself. I want to be in that number. I said, I want to be in that number. When the slumbering echoes of the everlasting hills will cry out, Thou art worthy, Jesus will present me to God the Father and say, This one shouted every Sunday. This one said hallelujah every week. This one went to church every time they had an opportunity. This one shouted when nobody else shouted. This one made noise when nobody else wanted to give you the glory. This one jumped up and down if they were the only one on their pew. This one cried out your name is holy. Your name is righteous. This one gave you the praise when nobody else wanted to shout your name. I want to be that one. You can sit down here if you want and act like God didn't bring you. But I want to be the one who says he brought me. You can keep your mouth closed all you want, but I've got something to shout about. You can sit down here and sleep all you want, but I've got something that I'm grateful for. God's been good to me. And I want him to present me before my father as one who always gave his name to praise. He was tired sometimes, but he kept on praising your name. She was sick sometimes, but she showed up to church anyway and gave your name to praise. There was trouble in their life sometimes, but they still came to church on Sunday and clapped glad hands. 
and raise their voices in anthems of praise because you are worthy. They were glad to be in the service. I wish I had a witness here. They were glad to show up to your house to worship. They came with their mind made up that if nobody wants to praise him, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Is there anybody here got something to praise God about? Is there anybody here glad that you haven't defiled your garments? Is there anybody here still holding up the blood-stained banner? Come on, shout by yourself. You don't need nobody to shout with you this morning. You got your own praise report. You got your own testimony. It wasn't your degree from college that kept you. It wasn't your money in the bank that kept you. It wasn't your connections that kept you. It was nobody but the Lord. The Lord's been good to me. He brought me from a mighty long way. And I'm going to praise his name if I got to praise him by myself. But I wish I had some company this morning who don't mind testifying. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Come on, help me testify. Because if you're going to praise God in heaven, you got to get in practice right now. If you're going to praise God in glory, you got to get in practice at Lily Grove. You can't praise him in the graveyard. You can't praise him in a casket. So since you are alive this morning, since you are not dead this morning, tell God thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you with my hands lifted up, with my heart filled with praise. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you might not feel like it, but I feel like praising his name. You might not want to. Come on, tell somebody else. If I don't look like what I've been through, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. I wish I had a witness here. Why don't you hug somebody? Tell them, let me tell you my story. I was on my way to hell and Jesus cut loose my stammering tongue. He took my feet out of the miry clay. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. So I've come to praise him. 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 Thank him. Give him the glory. Shout his praise. Call his name. Show forth his mercy. Tell him thank you for all you've done for me. I wish I had a real shouter here. I wish I had a real praiser here. I wish I had a real worshiper here. Who don't care who's looking at you. You don't care what time it is. You just grateful. He woke me up this morning. Put food on my table. Clothes on my back. I got a job in the morning. So I'm going to take a minute right now to tell God thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. He's worthy. I know he's all right. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said 
to the church. You, you want to know what the Spirit of God is like? Isaiah said he's the root of Jesse. He's the stump of David. And here's how you're going to recognize it. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And that's how you recognize a Christian. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. Knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he says, if you hold out, if you hold fast, you will walk with me in white. To walk with him in white means to have the victory. It does not mean just purity. It means victory. It means the warfare is over. It means the battle is fought. The victory has been won. And now you can walk with him in white.